So welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz, I'm the founder and director here at the Hunt RN Center, and uh, thrilled to uh, welcome you all to uh, our lunchtime walk, talk series. Um, today we have Bob Boyers here um, from Skidmore College. Uh, I figured I first met Bob when you were here with Margarita von Schreta many years ago for the Hanna Arendt movie. Um, and had a number of opportunities to, to meet and work and talk with Bob over the years. Uh, he spoke at our Hanna Arendt conference uh, that, with Claudia Rankin, giving an amazing response to her lecture, which was really, uh, I think, a highlight of the conference, that confrontation. Um, been up at Skidmore for, for your institute for a conference on race. Yeah. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, right before the pandemic uh, hit, Bob published a, a brilliant but poorly timed book, given book publications, uh, or book promotions, uh, called The Tyranny of Virtue, Identity, the Academy, and the Hunt for Political Heresies. Uh, a wonderful, a wonderful book that I encourage you all to read. Um, I, we were hoping to have him come then, shortly after, and obviously things shut down and things happened, but I'm thrilled to, to welcome him back, I think the third time to the Hanar Yes, thank you. And um, I look forward to his talk and then to a, a really exciting and vibrant conversation. So, take it away, Bob. Thank you. Um, of course, I, 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 so I had the notion that I should probably just talk and not prepare any remarks. Um, but when I do that, uh, I tend to go on and on and on, and we have a, a, a limited time, so I actually write some remarks. Um, I tie them, uh, I mark them up and cut them, so I would stick to my uh, appointed time, and uh, so this is it. Some of you, you know, will, will find some of this uh, familiar, not because you've read it before, uh, but because the subject has been with us for a while. So this really is uh, a subject that's been with us now for decades, and we don't yet uh, feel that we're done with it. Um, why not? Because several of the issues we began to talk about more than 30 years ago haven't vanished, and the environment in much of the culture uh, is a good deal more toxic than it was at a time when people thought the worst we had to worry about was the evisceration of the canon. Earlier this week, I sent off to an Italian magazine a commissioned essay on the end of the American century. And I did think, as I engaged with my assignment, that there is more to the decline of the American brand than the descent into scandal, criminality, and idiocy embodied in the Republican Party. Alas, though, the liberal intelligentsia will always look very good when measured against persons committed to voter suppression and the calculated dismantling of democracy. The liberal opposition to political tyranny has been anything but exemplary. For every thousand idiots at a Trump rally carrying signs about their freedom to avoid wearing masks during a pandemic, there are many academics at leading universities decrying the idea that robust debate and the disinterested pursuit of truth should be valued when such values derive from a world in which white men were dominant. For every American school board mobilizing parents against the teaching of America's racial history, there are countless teachers in prep schools and colleges across the country mobilizing to disallow the discussion of uncomfortable ideas about affirmative action, reparations, and speech codes. Is it hard to see what we look like to others? It shouldn't be. A writer friend in Italy sends me an email filled with sympathy for the culture of outrage and nonsense that I must continue to live in. A French intellectual, a reader of the New York Times who writes for my magazine, Selma Gundy, writes to me that even an American journalist she admired by the name of Michelle Goldberg is always ready to change the conversation whenever a criticism is leveled at the excesses of our own left liberal cohort. Did she actually think that anyone would take her seriously when she argued that concerns about the council culture that has become a pervasive threat to open inquiry in this country is a product of middle-aged sensitivities? 
Does she not read her own newspaper, my friend wondered, not taken the stories of cancellations actual and intended at major universities like MIT, for progressive consulting firms in New York, major art museums, and at the New York Times itself. Has Ms. Goldberg not heard that it is now doctrine among large portions of the American intelligentsia that all white people are inherently complicit in a system defined by white supremacy, and that anyone who wishes to challenge that proposition is by definition not merely fragile but racist, with the obvious consequence that such persons clearly ought not to be permitted to come anywhere near a student or any other decent human being. Many of us have attempted to lay bare some of the features of the junk thought that has made it nearly impossible to conduct a serious conversation about sensitive matters. What is junk thought? It is thought that purports to address the way things are while failing more or less entirely to acknowledge reality. There's nothing new in junk thought. We've always had it and always knew it might be difficult to wean people away from it comforting junk thought in eliminating the need to ask whether there might just be some flaw in an idea that has suddenly come to seem to many people irresistible. Is it not peculiar, we might be moved to ask, that the thinkers who are most influential among the white intelligentsia at the present time, writers like Ta-Nehisi Coates, Robin DiAngelo, and Ibram Kendi, proceed as if little or no progress has been made in American race relations over the course of the last 50 or 75 years. Now there is an idea that things are not much different today than they were in 1950, we might at least interrogate. How is it we might conceivably wonder that the refusal to acknowledge the obvious, that this idea, like so many others in this precinct, is a lie, is virtually never called out by infatuated reviewers of books by these authors? I'll be more than pleased to speak later on about varieties of junk thought and the toll that it's taken on our culture, on all of us, in fact. But I want for the moment not to lament particular instances of cancellation or to attempt to unbraid pernicious ideas. I want instead to speak very briefly of the cultural environment we have come to take more or less for granted. It is, think of it, something like a total cultural environment. An environment in which people who live in its mostly fond embrace are content to think the same thoughts and reassure one another that they are vigilant in their determination to adopt the correct postures, deplore the same deplorables, sidestep the same uncomfortable questions, and target and, if at all possible, punish the same unspeakable persons who have refused to fall into line. Exaggeration? Pretty to think so. Would that it were merely an exaggeration. Is it an exaggeration to say that at a major university, call it Princeton University, an open letter signed by hundreds of faculty members called for the setting up of a virtual star chamber to vet, approve, oversee, and the implication is clear, suppress the research and writing of their colleagues if it is found to be potentially offensive, potentially offensive, and to contradict the officially sanctioned party line at the university. Exaggerated to suggest that this is the sort of thing that might well emerge at virtually any American college or university today. In the spirit informing that Princeton letter, I want just briefly to get at, for it is the spirit that has largely created the climate of unanimity, groupthink, and intimidation that predominates in much of the progressive culture of the country. What does this environment look like? In my book, On the Tyranny of Virtue, I say that in the university it looks like a place in which all constituencies, I'll be happy to give you examples of this in a little while from my own uh, college, right? in which all constituencies have been mobilized for the same end, in which every activity is to be monitored to ensure that everyone is on board. Do courses in all departments reflect the commitment of the institution to raise awareness about all of the accredited topics? Are all incoming freshmen assigned a suitably pointed, 
heavily ideological summer reading text that tells them what they should be primarily concerned about as they enter college? Does the college calendar feature several times each week carefully orchestrated consciousness-raising sessions led by human resources specialists trained to facilitate dialogues leading where everyone must agree they ought to lead? Is every member of the community primed to invoke the customary terms, privilege, power, white supremacy, systemic racism, fragility, no matter how spurious they may seem in a given context? As I wrote when I offered this reading of the total cultural environment, though much of the regime instituted along these lines can seem kind and gentle in pursuit of what many of us take to be well-intentioned indoctrination, the impression that control and coercion are the name of the game is really hard to miss. When I went on the road with my book in the fall of 2019 and the winter of 2020, just before COVID changed everything, I found audiences in the main willing to listen, and I met many audiences in that six months before COVID. But in meetings with small campus groups or classes, I sometimes asked whether students or teachers or administrators were not appalled at the total mobilization in which they were complicit. And in the main, they told me they were not appalled. One college president who was generous enough to be present at one of my lectures, a man who had sent me a nice letter about a chapter of my book when it appeared a year earlier in the pages of the American Scholar, admitted that he had to yield, that was his word, yield, to what was clearly the will of his faculty, especially his younger faculty. Not to mention the students, he said, poised to show their wounds and parade their grievances. Otherwise, as he said, he would need to step down, couldn't lead. And yes, sure, there were many things he wished he could say, but couldn't. Not a matter of elementary diplomacy or good manners. He meant that he knew himself to be riding a horse over which he had very limited control and that he was by no means master in his own academic house. The environment was such that everyone would necessarily bow to the compelling dicta and prohibitions. Like Michelle Goldberg, they would know without much thinking about it to change the conversation at the right moments, or like an MSNBC host would know to invite in for conversation, chiefly those who could be relied upon to invoke the appropriate buzzwords, or like the rank and file academic would know which terms or books might best reassure everyone in the room that the enemies were clearly in our sights, the virtuous gathered together in a solidarity of mutual trust, all potential differences definitively suppressed. So, this is a part one. Unanimity, the total culture, coercion, intimidation, and the sense of living in a place where everyone wants to behave like good little boys and girls. Now we'll shift to part two. Uh, I've got many other things I'd like to share with you, but thought I would turn in these sort of final remarks to the matter of free speech, which many take to be the central issue in debates on the culture wars. And so, some final words on that. Because I think it's a subject that's often misunderstood. Um, in my classes, I know there are many things I can't say. I can't tell an 18-year-old who's failed two exams and written a barely literate paper that just possibly he's not bright enough to succeed at a liberal arts college. I can't say to the young woman who arrived at our first class wearing virtually nothing that perhaps she might rethink her wardrobe. I can't say that. Most of us know that we couldn't live in a world where everyone was free to say anything at all. We may say that students in colleges should be able to grapple with uncomfortable ideas, that they should not be guaranteed safe spaces, but we do not expect those students to tolerate abusive epithets or blatant expressions of crass misogyny or racism. Everywhere there is constraint imposed by law or custom, everywhere there are time, manner, and place restrictions. The First Amendment sponsors the view that free speech is an independent value and thus 
that the harm suffered by persons or groups as a result of mere words directed at them must be regarded as tolerable. To survive, we are told, we must learn to live with language we dislike. And yet we know, most of us know, that it is not merely slander or explicit verbal abuse that we are not willing to tolerate. We also know that what seems a necessary constraint to some of us will not seem so to others, and that before long, people will demand that we protect them from any speech that is controversial or disturbing. Battles over hate speech have routinely featured the assertion that speech is action, and that efforts to differentiate the one from the other are plainly hopeless. Long ago, efforts by Catherine McKinnon, Andrea Dworkin, and other activists focused on the actual harms suffered by women and others who are affected by the widespread availability of pornography. They argue that the principle of free speech seems paltry next to the actual harms asserted by people like themselves. And yet, we have seen all too often that the tendency to accept, uh, accept as a legitimate criterion of legal argument the felt experience of persons who claim to be irremediably wounded can lead to a promiscuous extension of the idea of protection. Ought students to be protected from a book that details the life of women in a traditional Islamic household on the grounds that the depiction will seem to some of them anti-Islamic? Must I no longer discuss with students the effects of Israeli policy on Palestinian citizens on the grounds that any criticism of Zionist policy will seem to some students and the parents who write me letters about this anti-Semitic? Should we forbid a student organization to sponsor a campus debate on torture if one of the speakers is a prominent legal scholar who has made a case for the efficacy of torture and is thus bound to upset audience members who regard such views as deeply upsetting? The felt experience standard is clearly a dangerous and unstable criterion. And we have all too often told ourselves that we can live with it and honor it without acknowledging the damage that it has done by creating a generation wanting above all to be safe from too much complexity or conflict. Of course, there are other kinds of assaults on speech, many of them high-minded, and again, sponsored by people blind to the potential consequences entailed in their avowals. Two years ago, I imagine most of you read about this when it happened, a storm broke around the publication of a not very good novel called American Dirt, written by a novelist named Janine Cummins. The storm was occasioned by a simple fact, namely that a novel about Mexican characters fleeing violence in their homeland was written by an author who is not herself Mexican. In fact, Cummins herself worried in and afterward to her own book that she was perhaps not the right person to offer such a book given the color of her skin. The storm covered in the daily press and in online forums focused not on the novel's literary merits or deficiencies. That, after all, is familiar territory for reviewers. But the turn represented by this recent assault on a writer was something else entirely in that it targeted not a book, but the person who wrote it, not because of what she had done, but because of what she is, who she is. The assault on so-called appropriation is but the latest in a widely published series of attacks, not only on particular words or expressions, but on the free exercise of the imagination. In one precinct after another, on university campuses and in publishing forums, writers are told that they ought not to create works that dare to enter the territory ostensibly owned by persons whose race or ethnicity differs from their own. In this, they are supported by writers like the New York Times' Roxane Gay, who commands that writers and artists stay in your lane. In fact, the virulence of attacks directed at the author of American Dirt and on other authors suggest that we have entered a new and dangerous cultural moment, marked not merely by cruelty and intolerance, but by a missionary zeal fueled by the wish to wipe selected writers off the map and punish them for so much as attempting to write their books. 
the people who reach for misleading terms like colonialism and cultural theft seem bent upon instigating something like a reign of terror in which booksellers who think well of a book are intimidated enough to cancel an author's appearance at their stores and, more important, to pull her book off their shelves. The urge to cleanse the common culture has a long and ugly history. Such efforts were once the province of reactionary demagogues and their followers on the political right. Traditionally, those efforts were challenged and blocked by liberals who affirmed the value of free speech in part to chasten and constrain the efforts of censors moved to excommunicate dissidents and heretics. But at present, Campaigns designed to cleanse the culture and forbid the exercise of the creative imagination are more apt to be the work of persons on the left who take pleasure in telling writers what they can and cannot write and sniffing around like petty tyrants, trolling the internet, calling out violations as if it were a crime for someone to write a book without being authorized by a cadre of cultural guardians. Appropriation anxiety is in several respects the least defensible of the several idiocies lately sweeping the culture. Major writers like Zadie Smith have bravely described efforts to prevent people from so much as attempting to represent the experience of persons unlike themselves as Philistine, that's her word. And others have likewise wondered how any serious writer could possibly sign on to the notion that only those with the lived experience of those they describe can conceivably succeed. Of course, appropriation comes in many forms and degrees, and it's always worth asking whether particular artworks do justice to their subjects and to the material they appropriate. As with free speech, we are entitled to ask when and how much and how well and with what apparent motives. But there is no question that the indiscriminate assault on appropriation is an ignorant and ill-advised assault on our liberty and on speech itself. It belongs to, it is an expression of the populist fever sweeping a considerable part of the country and it is a growing and insidious feature of cultural life on the left. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I'll get us going, and then I'm um, happy to keep a list of people who want to jump in, and can be very informally in a nice, sure. very impressive here, but small group. Uh, and so I think it'll be an interesting conversation. So I figured, um, Maybe I'll begin by attempting at least to push you on, on, on one or two areas because you know I, I'm not going to disagree with I take to be at least the basic point that in certain precincts uh, a kind of tyranny of virtue exists um, for whatever reasons, right? Uh, virtue signaling or or other, but. Um, you know, when you just use words, this like total mobilization, which you did use, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and other things, you know, you bring into the conversation a kind of totalitarian thought, uh, which, you know, comes from government, uh, usually, at least in, you know, traditional things, and actually punishes people with prison or um, death or exile um, for for, uh, you know, uh, deviant thought, or even not deviant thought, simply for being, whether it's a Jew or a, a bourgeoisie or whatever. Um, and it does strike me that, uh, you know, I, mean, I think it's a legitimate argument to say that what's, where's the real power in this country? I mean, my friends who are Trump supporters basically say the real power in this country is the cultural elite and they run the country. And then there are people I know who say, that's ridiculous, the power in the country is the government. And it's the worry is people taking over and not abiding by democratic elections. Um, and it strikes to me that in a way you agree with my Trump supporter friends, which is to say that the, the real threat in this country is the cultural elite, not the institutions of power 
with the police or the military, etc. And 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 let me say that you know even the cultural elite is you know I think maybe too much. I mean, you said all you said I, you said at one point any you know this way may well emerge any university. Well, I think that's clearly an overstatement. There are plenty of universities in this country where, in fact, it might be the opposite problem, where if you try and bring in someone like uh, Tanasi Kulich, you'll be like, you know, exiled or kicked out. And there are plenty of conservative, right-wing uh, universities in this country. Um, and so it's, it's really a problem of a certain cosmopolitan, Twitterate, liberal elite that is if not the majority, because I don't think it is the majority, a vocal and powerful minority at a certain number of institutions. I think it is, I think there's a real danger to protect people like a place like Bard or Skidmore from this, and I think a lot of people in this room are actually actively working to keep Bard to be an open place where we have this kind of debate. As you know, we've done a lot of these talks, and I think it's possible. It takes leadership, it takes a little guts, and so, I think it's important to analyze the problem because I think the problem's there. But do we it, should we be calling it total mobilization? Should we be analyzing it to these kind of programs? I mean, even if someone, I mean, this guy, this this young musician, musical professor from China, who was put on leave mm. at Michigan a couple weeks ago, after there was an uproar and the you know Academy uh, for Academic Freedom, uh, which I think you're a member of, I know I'm a member of, wrote a letter. He's been reinstated today. If he hadn't been reinstated, you know what? He could have come to Bard or to plenty of other colleges. I mean, there's a problem because we don't want people going to colleges and learning not in a world where they where they actually are confronted with great texts and great arguments and counter arguments. What are we overstating the problem? I guess that's the yeah, that's, that's the question in the end. Well, I think uh, several several ways of uh, sort of coming at this. One, uh, we briefly uh, sort of talked about just be before we got started um, this afternoon. And that is that there's a sense in which when you think about, read about, hear about uh, what's going on um, in uh, the, the, the Senate, the Congress, um, the state houses, um, and you understand that something um, really drastic uh, is on the way in terms of undermining the democracy, all the kinds of things that I've just talked about over the last 20 minutes and so on come to seem somewhat trivial. Um, I, I, I feel that myself, uh, I do. Um, uh, and yet, of course, when, uh, when I go back to my campus and so on, uh, and I observe what's unfolding on the campus and I talk to my students and so on, and I register the impact that uh, what I'm calling this mobilization is having on my students, I no longer think of it as so very trivial. Um, so, of course, when I use the term total culture, I, I'm not speaking of the uh, culture of the entire country, um, but I'm also not speaking simply about the total culture of uh, individual liberal arts campuses like my own. Um, uh, when I talk about the total culture, I'm also um, considering the media, um, the mainstream media. I'm talking about my newspaper, the New York Times, um, which isn't anywhere near as total um, as some people would like it to be, um, fortunately. Um, that you know, the New York Times, at least, is a, is, is a, new, a newspaper in which uh, John McWhorter um, has a platform um, and can say things that go directly against the grain of the things that are being promoted two or three times a week by other columnists in the same newspaper. So there's that. Um, but nevertheless, um, the total culture does seem to me to exist. Um, in a variety of ways. Is it a good idea, as Roger suggests, it isn't, um, to compare this total culture to a totalitarian society? No, um, I, I think it's not a good idea. Um, the, the term total culture um, is very deliberately selected, right, to suggest that there are certain features. Um, or just here, but the the, the, if you look at the most popular podcast in the country, Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. um, what's the other one? Free, I mean, 
they're the ones that they, these are not left wing woke no, podcasts. No means, right. I mean, and they are have enormously influential in the culture. Absolutely, but I'm speaking about the uh, mobilization of forces on the liberal or progressive left. Um, that's what I'm describing. The mobilization that's taking place on my side uh, of the culture, uh, the culture with which I have always identified. Um, the culture in which I still regard myself as a participant member. Um, and that's what's disturbing. It's the reason I, I, I wrote my book. Um, and, uh, and there, I think, I'm describing something that's real, um, that exists. Look, example, small, small example. Um, at my college, good liberal arts college, um, Periodically, several times a year, we receive, faculty members receive, questionnaires um, asking us to identify the kinds of anti-racist and progressive materials that we are using in our courses. Um, if we report back um, that um, our courses don't have anything to do with those kinds of materials, the question that is put to us, I mean, well, I'm not threatened. I mean, I've been at Skidmore since 1969. I, I'm, not, I'm not worried. Um, but the question put to us is, why not? Um, isn't there a way to um, reconceive uh, your course in 19th century European novel, one of my courses, right? So that it will, in fact, reflect an effort Right, to bring those kinds of materials into the curriculum of your course. I resent that. Um, many other faculty members resent that. Um, I don't want, I mean, I, you know, I don't want someone overseeing uh, what I'm offering in my courses um, and asking me right, to do my best uh, to adjust um, the curriculum of my courses to meet some standard that has been uh, basically assigned by a human resources team that has nothing to do with academic life um, in, in our department. Okay, so that's, that's just one little thing. I resent the fact every four years we teach a freshman English course. Uh, it's a seminar. Every four years. Everyone does it. We create our own um, course. So I've been teaching a course over the last eight years or so, um, once every four years, called Representations of the Holocaust. It's a subject I've written a great deal about over the course of 40 years, and, uh, and works very well with my freshmen. But all freshmen in uh, the college uh, are assigned uh, a text to read over the summer. And all professors teaching a freshman seminar that year are required um, to spend uh, time in their seminars discussing that text. Um, now, that seems to me a perfectly lovely idea. I like that idea. All freshmen read those books. All instructors read the books and spend some time teaching them. But of course, if the book that's selected is Ibram X. Kendi's book on how to be an anti-racist. And I say, it's simply, it's not that my, my politics are, um, are very different from Ibram Kendi, but I could think of all sorts of wonderful books whose politics would differ from mine, which I would be happy to talk about and teach in my classes. This is a bad book. It's a propagandistic book. It contains things that are scandalously um, absurd. So that's the kind of book that's assigned to freshmen, all freshmen. That's the kind of book we have to sit and discuss with our students. We had a wonderful moment in late September. A relatively new colleague of mine, he's in his second year, a black intellectual named Calvin Baker, um, who's a friend of ours, I have a long interview with him in the next issue of Sun Magundi coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, he was um, appointed 
to deliver the annual freshman lecture, um, which is, of course, to focus on the book that everyone has read. <laughs> so we got together in an enormous tent on the campus, 700 freshman students, dozens of faculty members and administrators, and Calvin, um, who's written a very interesting book um, recently uh, on race relations. He's had four novels, but this is his first nonfiction book. Um, was introduced, and he said, I was incredulous when I was told that this was the book that was assigned to freshman students to read, because it's a terrible book. Um, and he began to talk about why this was so. It was a shocking sort of moment. Uh, because he was introduced by the head of the seminar program and so on, who had selected that book and been approved by a committee and so on. And it was just sort of a, a little sort of break um, in the sense of this sort of a mobilization. Uh, he was someone right, uh, who would actually say that this was not the kind of book you ought to be assigning to incoming freshmen. But, and I could give many other instances of this, so what I'm complaining about is not this particular thing or that particular thing, um, but the environment of unanimity and mobilization. That is the thing that I find appalling. And of course when I, um, when I learn, when I read various um, surveys, polls, telling us that uh, a very large proportion of students undergraduate and graduate students in colleges all across the country um, uh, frequently are afraid to say, either in classes or anyone else, what they actually think. I have to feel that that environment is, in some way, what I'm describing as a total cultural environment. The students know it, they feel it, they resent it, um, and um, when, when I went to class a day after the, uh, uh, my friend Calvin Baker had given his talk, my students were bubbling uh, about what that represented. And they said they'd never sort of expected to see anyone come out with anything well, like Calvin that. Calvin Baker is black. Correct? Sorry? Calvin Baker is black. He's correct? a black intellectual, yeah. and all of his novels are focused on race relations. Um, and his new book that came out about two years ago um, uh, is is a book about race relations. So part of the legitimacy is that an African American exactly. said yeah. that. So I mean, I think it's an important part of your story to mention Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. could be said by someone. Oh no! If I if I had been the person mm -hmm. selected, we wouldn't have the same effect. No, clearly not. Which is another issue about we need to go into. Yeah. No, but are, are we thinking the same thing? Because it's, it seems to me that a lot of what you're talking about, there are two. There are two kind of rhetorical problems, and I, 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 I sometimes wish people would think, think about it kind of rhetorical. And the one is the argument by Homer, you know, which is traditionally considered to be the weakest of all rhetorical arguments, but it's the most prominent one that they use nowadays. You know, that, 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 that what matters is, you know, your, your words only matter insofar as they kind of relate to certain, or to who you all are in certain ways. I mean, precisely what you're talking about. I mean, John McWhorter, thank God for John McWhorter, but obviously, if he were white, I mean, this would not be happening. And the effect that it's happened. Yeah, isn't that a problem? <laughs> well, exactly. But, but, but again, there's a question of, like, I, mean, I, I mean, I wonder, given that it, it happens in all sorts of kind of places, I mean, even we ourselves kind of recognize this, we, and we try to accede to it. I, I think the other one is, and to quote our previous president, a truthful hyperbole. You know, the, the kind of the notion that, I mean, Donald Trump would say things all the time that were just factually untrue, but he used that one phrase at one point. One of the great things about him is that he's often so transparent. And he kind of talked about, about what he was doing as truthful hyperbole. But it seems to me that when you're saying, you know, talking about, for example, there's been no kind of improvement in race relations in the past 50 or 75 years, that, that you know, that's, you know, that people kind of who are saying this kind of know in some ways that that's not true. But the point is, you know, that, that by kind of putting it in that way, you know, it, 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 it produces a certain rhetorical effect, which is exactly, there's an urgency, there's a, there's a sense of importance to it. Why is it so important to push back against that? Claim. Well, because it's a lie. 
Um, but it doesn't, but do you see what I'm saying? I mean, rhetoric is not, I think the problem with what people, a lot of people is that we function only on the basis of logos. I mean, it only, something has to be kind of true or kind of untrue. But there are a lot of ways in which language functions rhetorically. It's not about being true or untrue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is something being um, approached through that claim which is an approach of a type of expression of, of continued oppression. Mm -hmm. And so to consider it as just deception seems mm -hmm. to, to miss part of the rhetorical force of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I really appreciate a lot of what you're saying, particularly the pedagogical struggle. But the, isn't, you know, I mean, t in certain ways, this encapsulation seems very much the culture wars as ever. Either it's aesthetically good or it's politically charged. Mm -hmm. And part of the way that you seem to be discounting, right, like the, is that the books are bad. Now, what if Kendi Ibrahim's book was great in your aesthetic estimation? Sure. So really what you're saying is that, is that aesthetic value is more important than anything else and that you get to judge what it is. And if it's not good, then you shouldn't have to teach it. Oh, no, I don't think that I shouldn't have to teach it. I taught it. Uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm a big boy, and, you know, I'm teaching, I'm teaching the course, and of course right, I'm Right, but there, I just want to point out that there's this aesthetic, I mean, this has been sort of the controversy since the 90s, as you reference it, right? Which is... Even I, since the 80s. Yes, like, aesthetic judgment should be that which decides what ends up in our classroom. And the whole taking to task of that argument has always been who gets to decide what has it. Is it aesthetic or intellectual? Because of well, I mean, I think it's just, again, it's the canon, right? I, look, I, um, I, I, I myself would not um, um, object to a, a book um, that was assigned to freshmen or strictly on aesthetic grounds at all. Um, the last time I taught that freshman course, the book that was selected was the Ta-Nehisi Coates book, Between the World and Me. Now, in terms of the sentences in that book, that, that's a very good book. Um, that's a beautifully written book. Uh, but I objected to that book as well. Um, objected to it because, again, it is a propagandistic work. It is not a properly uh, sort of disinterested and scholarly appreciation of the race problem in the country. If you're going to talk, if you're going to assign a book that has to do with race, there are many first-rate books um, that are out there that one could assign, and those are not uh, the books I would give to incoming freshmen. But again, my objection, my objection is not aesthetic. Right. But again, the, the pushback is always what is disinterested, right? Because sure. this illusion that there are texts that are disinterested is the whole premise of, of, of yeah, this yeah, argument. I, yeah. I, I think it's, it's a bit of a red herring to use the argument that's often used for, well, that this is stuff that takes place in university campuses and publishing companies, and they don't have any real power. That's the right wing canard. The real power is in Washington and the Republican Party and so on. But that is a red herring because that's about institutional power. Yeah. It's more useful, I think, to think in terms of the consequences that this may be having. And the consequences can be dire even if the people promoting it are relatively small in number. Yes. And I, I think you see this in politics and you see it in, in culture. In politics you see that there are already consequences in the de Democratic Party, for example. Mm -hmm. And that the liberals are being squeezed more and more, not only by the right, but also by the left, with political consequences. In culture you see it because in appropriation, for example, publishers are so afraid um, to publish anything by somebody who's not the right color and that kind of thing. But what is, the, what is the result of that? The result is that they won't be publishing books about, let's say, I don't know, Africa by a white scholar. Yes. What that means in the end is that you have a whole generation of people, more than one, where um, the uh, curiosity in cultures and races and religions and so on, outside your own experience, is going to be killed. Yes. Because you're not going to be able to do that kind of stuff without being thwarted or punished even. And so you get a more and more provincial and narrow culture, which is a very serious consequence, I think, of people who are promoting something who, again, may not be very large in number. And, that's, and it's not just the universities, it's, 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 it's all over the place. And uh, in the end, the, the real danger is that it's only going to help the far right. 
Mm -hmm. Because they use all this stuff that's going on in universities, however many people may be involved, doesn't matter. Even if it's a, a handful of students or faculty, it's used against higher education, and it, so it, it, it kills intellectual inquiry, it's politically damaging, and it's, it's certainly academically damaging as well. So I think if you look at the consequences, one shouldn't say the, the argument, well, but that's not where the real power is, shouldn't really be a, 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 a conclusive argument. Mm -hmm. I agree, and, and again, this is why for me, um, a, a lot of the emphasis when I think about this sort of thing um, really ought to be on, on the environment, the, the climate. Um, and that, I think, has a, an enormous impact. And you know, in the country, you can, I, I can, because I, I spend so much time you know, in, uh, in, in this climate, I, I can provide uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of pieces of anecdotal evidence to suggest um, the way this works, the way this climate takes hold of people. And you know, each time you, know, you do that, you think, that's just like a, a tiny little anecdote. That's just you know, not even really, it doesn't rise to the level of evidence. Well, of course, uh, the question is, how many of those uh, pieces of sort of anecdotal, anecdotal evidence or testimony do you need to amass before you have a sense that you are actually describing something like a climate? Or an environment, you know, and uh, you, I mean, you see this. I, I see it. Um, you have to go much beyond the New York Times. I mean, obviously, I read much beyond the New York Times, like everyone else in the room. But you don't really have to go far beyond the New York Times to see it. Look, here's, here's a, a trivial thing. Trivial. Very recently, I, you, I imagine you you saw it in, in the Times, in the two stories in the Times over the course of a few days. It had to do. Uh, with a letter sent by a um, very great institution, the Art Institute of Chicago, right, um, to 80 docents, okay? So the docents of the Art Institute of Chicago, there are 80 of them, right, are unpaid. So we're not talking about a terrible uh, event in which people were denied their living because they were white. No, no, no. These are all volunteers. They're volunteers. Uh, and because they're unpaid volunteers, many of them have been working in that docent position for 15 years. 15 years, okay? Um, no complaints. No institutional record of complaints against any of them. They bring classes around, uh, they give tours, and so on. They make no money, okay? So, a letter. And of course, virtually all of them, virtually all of them, are white. You have to have uh, a situation in life where you have enough money that you can volunteer hours and hours each week to serve as a docent. Okay, that's just an incidental. And yeah, they took uh, courses fact. and were certified. Oh, sorry, they took courses and were certified. They took courses. They were certified. I mean, the whole, no Most, complaints. And mostly right. women. Right. A, a blanket letter is sent to. It's quoted in the newspaper, to all 80 docents telling them that their services will no longer be required um, because right, the institute has decided um, to develop a program in which docents will hereafter be paid. Right? They will go through a competitive process and of course the goal is very admirable as far as I'm concerned you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a left liberal. Um, the, the goal is to bring people into the, uh, into the museum who will better reflect the sort of ethnicity and the race of the population in Chicago, right? Makes sense, makes sense. Well, you could do that. Fritz would also have money to pay them. Terrific, you know. But why, but why a blanket letter um, simply dismissing the 80 people who've been doing the job and about whom there's no complaint. Uh, why? Um, why not um, do it another way? Um, why not suggest that the 80 docents who've been trained and done a good job um, might now be used to train a new generation of docents and so on? Um, why not? No, but of course one wouldn't worry about that. 
And of course, the people in charge of this, the administrators of the Institute, were shocked at uh, the reaction to this, uh, to this move that they had made. Shocked, shocked. Um, because after all, you know, one doesn't have to be particularly sensitive or concerned about um, 80 mostly elderly white women. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about them. So, and of course, the, 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 people, the, the people who made this move are, you know, um, powerful um, directors uh, of, of the institution, white and Jewish, um, you know, li liberals, liberals. They're kind of small thing. Not, nothing, so, nothing, nothing dreadful, nothing terrible, but just sort of a, a, sort of a sign of the way um, a climate exists in the culture that allows people to feel that this is it's nothing. You know, people just dismiss people. But much more important than that is, for example, that the effect of the, the debate on education, or the effect that the arguments on education had on the uh, last elections in Virginia. Mm -hmm. There you rarely see a political effect of this kind of thing. You do. A Republican wouldn't have won if, if education hadn't become an issue. Oh, I agree entirely. And, and the Republicans in, uh, uh, in, in uh, the state of Illinois were all over this. Uh, this story uh, instantly. Uh, I read several on, online uh, um, letters that went out to constituents and so on, um, pressing home, you know, what this this indicated. And yeah, it's, again, it's, it's small, it's just trivial. You know, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't yeah, that's the whole point that you were saying. This may be a small thing in the great sweep of what's going on, but it's being very consciously picked up and weaponized by the right. Yeah. And very, very effectively. So if that's the case, you can't say these are small things that can be absorbed in the kind of culture that we all kind of grew up with as long as college, etc. It's a different world now. Yeah, different world. Being, you know, and again, again um, every now and then, um, you know, again, in, in, in John McWhorter's uh, columns lately, he sort of calls attention to little things that, you know, that I had noted myself. Um, that managed to pass me by, which again are, are small, uh, but again they suggest the way that in the climate um, that uh, that we've allowed to sort of take hold of us, um, certain things are not even worth sort of noting or mentioning. He quotes, for example, a sentence from the uh, president of Harvard, the recent Drew Gilpin Faust, the Faust, who says, who complains, just within the last month or so, about the failure to confront our collective failure to confront our racial history. And you say, we have been complicit in recent years in a failure to confront our racial, a failure to do certain things about our racial history. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, can, I can get all over that. but. Failure to confront it, really? Um, you know, and what is she talking about? It's simply not true. Um, because so, we're sitting in a room here with no people of color. But we're talking about our racial history and about all sorts of other such things. Does it delegitimize us not to be people of color? What's that? I said, does it delegitimize the discussion? Like no, but it, it raises the issue of, I mean, on the, and I, I, I I sometimes think that the, the kind of what seems to be a sort of gracelessness uh, with which the, say, the docent program was dismantled, which seems more to be about um, manners, management, a type of bureaucratization, and less about, because you agree that ultimately that that is probably a move in the right direction, Absolutely. right? Like that, so I, I, I think that equating that with a type of some people would say that the fact that that program has persisted for so long, obviously the domain of a very privileged, very monolithic slice of one of the most diverse cities probably in the world, yes. is the evidence of not confronting our racism. So um, I, I wonder if what's at root there is less about a type of particularly um, sort of 
you know, whatever, PC, woke, whatever, energy, and more a result of a kind of bureaucratic, um, kind of mechanized, human resource language and conduct that goes through all issues, right? We are all alienated from our workplaces. We are alienated from our health care. We are alienated from our governments. And it, when it tends to intersect with the world of culture, you know, we feel like it's a lightning rod. Um, so I don't know. I, I do think that, you know, the Dozen example is actually really significant. Um, Right? How is it that the Art Institute of Chicago has had a docent program with 80 white women unpaid for th until 2021? Because men were actively discriminated against. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you think it's a product of, 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 of prejudice against black people or time? No, it's, a, it's the intersection of class, race, sure. in America. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So how do you... I mean, I guess so what I I'm saying is the uh, answer to that. What I'm saying is that that is confronting the, 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 the history of racism and, and, or the history of inequality or what we, are, we hate to hear is structural racism. There it is in a structure. Until 2021, nobody else could really afford or have access to a program that probably granted a lot of prestige, a lot of social status, a lot of cultural capital, right, that was being hoarded by, by a very, very small group of the society. The only, the only way I think you could, you could really sort of get into this um, as an argument, I think, would be if you, uh, if you found that there were significant numbers of people of color, for example, who had applied for those positions as docents in Chicago, or for that matter at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where apparently there are uh, 150 uh, docents, um, only a very small proportion of whom uh, are people of color in the same way. But in other words, um, the, the docent programs at, at um, museums all over the country, uh, I, know, I know this is true in St. Louis, at the major art museum in St. Louis and so on, generally um, are, are held by people who can afford to work without being paid. And that's always been the case, you know, with those in programs. Um, and of course, once you once you make a decision um, to change that and to and to make those into paid positions, obviously you have to have funding for it. Um, uh, and 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 again, I I, I applaud that. Um, but that's well, an example of confronting structural racism. Uh, it was built it's... into the structure of that program that the demographic of the type of person who could hold that job was most likely going to be retired, have some sort of access to income, and have a lot of leisure time. Mm -hmm. And would probably invite their friends of the same class. It reflects, and would and then they hold that institutional power. Mm -hmm. It reflects, I, I would say it reflects the reality of the class and economic reality of the society. Um, I don't. I don't know that I would go along with the notion that it reflects uh, racism. That. That again, I, I'd have to know more about those people who who actually applied for those positions and whether those positions were uh, were ever open, right, uh, for to competition. I don't know about that. I don't. Uh, I imagine it was not the case. Um, you know that there were large numbers of people of color who applied for those positions and were turned away. I can't imagine that was the case, given. Uh, the fact that the directors and administrators of institutions like the Artists of Chicago are themselves left liberals and progressives. I can't, I, I can't really imagine that would have been the case. But um, if you think again about the climate, right, it's a climate in which a term like sensitivity uh, is often invoked, right? And this seemed to me a case in which sensitivity um, in the handling of the dismissal of the docents was not in evidence. I agree. Right? And uh, you know, and that's it. So if you can talk about a climate, yeah. or a climate in which sensitivity would be, you know, very selective in the way that it would be uh, applied. Um, and this was an instance in which <coughs> in which you didn't get that. Can, can I give another example of where class and race might intersect? I have a slight personal involved. The Stuyvesant School in New York mm -hmm. used to probably have more than 50% of the pupils were Jewish. Yes. 
Now more than 50%. Right. <laughs> so my, my daughter. Now more than 50% uh, are Asian. And um, somebody said to me the other day, ah, yeah, but how many blacks uh, are established? Very small number. Now, it, does that mean that the Asians, as the Jews were before, are privileged and, and so on? Or is it something else? In fact, they're not. They're, 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 when my daughter had to go to, when we were introduced to the school, many of these, these Asians were immigrants. Yes. And they had to have, have translators on the spot because many of them didn't even speak English. So the reason that there are a very small number of blacks may not have nothing to do with institutional racism or not confronting racism. There must be other reasons. Now, there are, obviously there are reasons, but I think people are much too quick to apply sort of systematic racism to problems that exist in representation and so on, which actually obscure them. No, I, I kind of wonder. I'm sorry, Thomas. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, I, mean, I, I, I do wonder what, what type of society we want to achieve. I mean, certainly, if you're dealing with the Art Institute of Chicago in a very diverse city, and you know, this is a publicly funded institute, you wanted, you know, as many people of different constituencies in the in the in the city to be involved in it in some way and be benefiting from it. But, but I mean, I'm just if, if you just pursue the even kind of on, is any organization or any kind of cultural group that is not perfectly kind of representing the demographics of the city that it's in, um, is that by definition racist? I mean, if we think of something like classical music or versus opposed to popular music, mm -hmm. I mean, pop classical music, you know, has tended to be very uh, white and Asian. And, and that's, like, whereas, you know, popular music, if anything, is dominated by people. Um, so, but, but is that a sign of the racism of a society that actually, let it be said, the most successful and economically remunerative form of music is actually dominated by people of color, mm -hmm. where classical music is not? I mean, if, if you're kind of running an orchestra and you're not, a, and I'm just wondering, to what extent is that a problem, to what extent is that not a problem? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I guess in terms of what you both just, just said, you and, and Ian just said, um, I mean, racism uh, has become, and in, in part for good reason, something like a default explanation for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And in, in many cases, um, it's, it, it ought not to be the default explanation because it, it doesn't work. Now, if you think about an orchestra, you mentioned orchestra. Right? Mm -hmm. um, our, our youngest son is a violinist. Um, and when you um, when you try out uh, for an orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, mm -hmm. um, no one sees you. Mm -hmm. uh, no one sees your color, um, your ethnicity, and so on. And uh, and as a as a result, right? Until quite recently, and so on, we've had largely um, white and Asian uh, mm -hmm. population in the major orchestras. That's beginning to change. Why? Well. Obviously, because for one thing, um, uh, other kinds of, of people of color, including black people, are going to conservatories. They, they're going to the New England Conservatory and to Juilliard and so on. Um, when our son was was um, um, was applying to Juilliard uh, many many years ago and so on, and Juilliard sent us um, the brochures and so on. Virtually everyone in the Juilliard orchestra was Asian. Um, virtually everyone. Um, and it wasn't because, you know, whites were being discriminated against, and it wasn't that whites weren't applying to Juilliard, it's just that they weren't as good um, as the Asian musicians who were applying to Juilliard. It wasn't clearly a matter of racism, um, but I, I think, you know, clearly it is the case, you know, that um, when, when you just indiscriminately, right, um, resort to that claim that racism is at the bottom of everything, you often find that you don't understand what's going on. Certainly at, um, at Stuyvesant and other such schools um, in New York, um, the problems, I would say, have nothing to do with racism, but they have to do with systemic racism. Um, they have to do with the schools that most of the black children uh, in New York City are going to. Um, they have to do with you know class differences and advantages. Um, the kid, I, we know kids whose parents pay for them to be tutored before they take the test for the special high schools uh, in New York. You know, so yeah, so racism has a lot to do with it, but not. 
um, racism in the sense that those schools are discriminating against black children. No, um, there's just a test. There's no, there's no interview, there's nothing. It's just a test. Um, and we all know why certain kinds of kids, you know, have advantages um, in taking those kinds of tests. Uh, you know, I mean, nobody's, I think no one's in this room is going to argue that. I mean, it's, it's, it's real. It's, you know, it, it, those advantages are real. Yeah. I actually have a question or comment on something you said a little earlier. When you give the, uh, about the reaction to, you know, Calvin, Calvin Baker's talk. Uh-huh. In case I'm muted here. I tend to mumble anyway. No, no, no. You said you use the phrase, your students, they know it, they feel it, they resent it. And in my head I added, and they avoid it. Mm -hmm. I read resumes every year from the top pre-med students going into Kelly's program. Ah. And you know, they say they're the brightest people. And I look at I look at their transcripts. And the they're not going to liberal arts classes. I mean, they're going to go to medical school, they're, ta they're taking sciences, yeah. and, you know, 15 years ago, when I first started doing that, I mean, the fun thing about applying to be a doctor is you can take, you know, other your pre-med classes, yes. you, can, you can take whatever the university offers, and there's just been a clear line, and I asked Kelly, about who's my, my employer here, who agrees with this observation, uh -huh. they're avoiding, and I, you know, I was an English major in college, uh -huh. I wouldn't be an English major today, I don't uh -huh. know what I'd be, but... Yeah. Yeah. What well, do you think it is? Why do you think it is? Because they don't want to deal with these issues of the, you know of the, you know having to read you know whether it's having to read Kendi or having to do or, or or to treat literature through a particular lens and be sensitive that if they're off the lens you know that they're going to get reported. Hurry. <laughs> So, I mean, but, but I'm saying that, that that's yeah. from, a, from a single observation. Sure. Many people in this room, you know, teach students. I don't know if that's your general observation. Uh, well, I can give you just just um, uh, information about first of all where uh, our students of color are enrolling, uh, what kinds of uh, courses they're enrolling in, and for the most part, they are not enrolling in arts, liberal arts uh, courses. They're required to take a handful of them, not even a handful, uh, three. Um, and most of them are, are majoring in business. Um, some of them are majoring in sciences and in computer science. Uh, our people of color in, in our student body uh, Skidmore is now 25% um, non-white, so that's a decent number, um, and again, you talk about progress. Um, when I came to Skidmore in 1969, uh, there were two black students in the college, two black students in college, a small number of Asian students, uh, but that's it. But that's progress in a very, very small class, right? Sure. And, and I mean, I think there's also, you know, dozens of statistics that show that the amount of black wealth in the United States has decreased over the last 40 years. So, I mean, there's a sense that, yes, the liberal classes, you know, again, the elites have, have enacted a type of, of representative inclusion. Anyway, Thomas, you go on. But what we're doing... What, what we're doing uh, at Skidmore is um, using, we're not a wealthy institution, like Bard, we are not, we are not a wealthy institution. Well, Bard's wealthier than it was a year ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we've, we've, always, we've always struggled and have a very limited financial aid budget, but we d determined um, about 15 years ago to use a very large proportion of a financial aid budget to change. Uh, the demographics uh, of the institution. And we've been much more successful at that than we've been at recruiting uh, people of color to teach. Um, because people of color don't want to live in Saratoga Springs, which is 3% non-white. Um, so, you know, that, that's been very difficult. When we recruit people of color to, to the college, uh, they come in for a year or two and then they get a, a job somewhere else and they leave, which is entirely understandable. Um, but, but I think um, it is the case that um, the, the climate in terms of bringing larger numbers of people of color into the middle class um, is such that it's had an effect. There are enormous numbers of people, black people, in the middle class and um, compared to what there was in 1950. That's clear. Those numbers are clear. The overall wealth 
I, 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 of the black population compared to uh, the white population uh, is very disappointing. Um, but you know, if you, one of my best friends is, is a sociologist at Harvard named Orlando Patterson. Um, and he's written several books about uh, about that, about mm. the, the transition yeah. um, of the black population of the country into the middle class. And, and though he is by no means um, in, entirely optimistic about everything that we're doing, his his books very clearly track the progress, and there's very significant progress. But again, you know, if you say that if you say that. 70% uh, of the black population is not yet in the middle class. That's a terrible number, right? Um, but if you say that 30% of the black population is now in the middle class, and less than 10% was in the middle class in 1950, that's progress. That's progress. I mean, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of people. Um, it's not n nothing. Um, you know, and, and the, yeah. Sure. I mean, this notion of, uh, of taking into account progress in the here again and again by activists who are, let's say, beyond the undergraduate age, right? That this is important to acknowledge uh, to that progress has been made to, to learn from that and to see how one can uh, go further. And there's one term, if we, if I think of progress in the, in the past 30, 40 years, uh, that has been prominent, I think, uh, in the attempt to uh, to achieve more equality, and that's affirmative action. And uh, uh, affirmative action seems to be out of the vocabulary and out of the picture completely. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, what do you think? Why this is? Of course, in, in, in culture, affirmative action is less <laughs> is less uh, uh, applicable than in uh, like in, in, in social um, uh, in, in social contexts. Uh, but still, that idea, and one could even, as a metaphor, apply it to, say, uh, you know, a, a, a course syllabus in the UK. Okay? Mm -hmm. You have two, you have two books you're excited about, and you would like to put in the syllabus, and uh, maybe in this semester, just in that spirit, you decide you, you know, you take the novel of this minority writer, and the next semester you might change it up because. You know, that, that spirit, of course, to a certain extent, also translates. But I'm, I'm sometimes just puzzled. Maybe this is so dated in the 80s, I'm, no, <laughs> no. in a way. Or I'm, I'm wondering what your take on that is. I mean, I'm not on the culture of that, but just yeah, the well, idea of affirmative action. Well, sometimes, sometimes you know, just, just a, a term uh, falls out of favor um, for political reasons. I think there are lots of reasons um, why affirmative action is not invoked as frequently as it was 20 years ago. Um, uh, so I think I think lots of uh, lots of um, uh, black people uh, dislike the term. Um, that the term suggests a special kind of favoritism which they themselves deplore. Um, that black people are, for example, overwhelmingly opposed to quotas, right? And affirmative action, insofar as it's been associated with quotas and so on, mm -hmm. seems demeaning, um, and many black people reject uh, that notion. Uh, that's the many polls that suggest that black people dislike the whole notion of a quota system at any level. Um, but then uh, I think it's also the case that um, in the progressive world, right? Um, we've moved beyond affirmative action, mm. where the, the conversation has now um, more to do with things like reparations. Um, and, you know, reparations and affirmative action are very close in some respects. Um, when Skidmore determines, for example, I got, I'm sorry to invoke Skidmore, but I, I know a lot about it, you know, having, having been there for more than a half a century. Um, when Skidmore dis determines, to a lot, 75% of its financial aid budget to bringing in people of color, right? That's a form of reparations. Um, uh, now you could say that the motives have to do with sort of looking good, right? Of changing the look. You know, it's good, but you, you, can, you can sort of question the motives involved in doing it, but meanwhile, that's what's happened. Um, that's it. And, and it is a form of reparations. It says we have, 
for a century, you know, managed to, to be an almost entirely white institution. And we're going to do something to change that. that and, and how do you do that? Well, that's one way you do it. You spend your money. Um, I can assure you there are plenty of alums who give donations to Skidmore College who are not thrilled about that. Um, and, and yet the institution has determined to do it um, because it's the right thing uh, to do and because it's the only way to accomplish this. Um, and so, uh, so we're doing it. Um, and, and it's a great thing. Um, you know, and of course, you know, you can do those kinds of things um, you can do affirmative action, you can do reparations in a serious way, um, and then you can do it in a shoddy uh, way. Um, some years ago, my wife and I were at a, a, a dinner a party um, given by a faculty member of Williams College, uh, a historian we knew slightly. Um, and, uh, and the president of Williams College was there at the time. This is a, a first-rate institution. And, um, and we were talking about comparable efforts underway at Williams. And the president, uh, at one point, began to speak about problems um, that they were having in uh, keeping some of the students they had been bringing in on scholarship um, uh, up to the level at which they could do the work um, and, and graduate uh, at, at Williams. John McWhorter talks about this in his, his book as well. And um, so we just said, um, have you instituted um, a, a program uh, to tutor those students? Do you have advisors on hand to uh, help students who come in from the higher education opportunity program at Williams. We have the same program at Skidmore. And he said, no, we don't do that at Williams. And you know, we, we were polite about it, but we said, well, then that's not a good program. You, you're, not, you're not serious about it. I mean, you, you've got to, I mean, Williams is a, is a very wealthy institution. You've got to hire those people and do the job. Um, you can't just bring those students in and then leave them, you know, to uh, to, to fail. Well, Bob, I have a I question mean, about do you think it, it's, it, there's a difference between an educational institution in this respect, and everything you say makes total sense to me, you mm. need to help them and tutor them and so on and so forth. But to what extent sh should that apply to other institutions like media and publishing companies and so on, where they say we need a more diverse workforce, we need to bring in black editors or have more writers and so on and so forth. Yeah. Should they also say, well, maybe the writing isn't quite up to scratch yet, but we really need to sort of mentor them and tutor them? And is that the, should that be the role of editors and publishers and so on? Or, or should they not, should this not really apply outside education? Uh, good luck with that. That's <laughs> a good question. No, it really is. I, 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 you know, I, it is a great question. And I don't know how, how it would work in a, in a publishing house. Um, I do know, because we have a very close friend who's, uh, uh, um, who's graduated from, from Skidmore 12 years ago and, and went and got a degree in cura curatorial studies and then went to work with the Museum of Modern Art. And I won't give you her, her story, but basically at a certain point she was required to tutor in a very, very close way several younger people of color who had come into the curatorial program um, right out of school um, who needed help. Right. Who needed help with their prose. Even with their prose. Um, prose required to uh, write the law textbooks in, in an exhibition that they'd been assigned to work on. You know, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, and of course some of that could be awkward and, you know, un uncomfortable. You know, when you're talking about you know adults, you know, but I, I think there it was felt that it was working, mm -hmm. that you could do that, and MoMA had made that exactly that determination that you were just describing. Mm -hmm.
um, we're, we're going to change the face of the curatorial staff. You know, after you know, 75 years, not wondering how you do that. So, but in the publishing, I don't know. That would be hard. That would be really hard. We're gonna. People continue to talk about this, but we're out of time and we're already having to leave to go team. So, thank you all very much. Thank you, Bob, for coming. Thank you all.